PhD in psychology and um, also have a degree in anthropology. So I'm really excited to be, um, should I press the button here probably? Yeah, um, to be co-leading the seminar series with Shinobu. Uh, I do research in the US and Sub-Saharan Africa, India and Southeast Asia. Um, and we're gonna hear speakers uh, talk about many of those regions, which is very exciting. And we have speakers coming from all across the globe as far away as Israel. Um, and we know that you know 95% of uh, psychological science takes place in Western high-income contexts. And so we think it's about time that we start diversifying our science to make sure that it's healthy, thriving, and useful. Um, so uh, that is the series, and Shinobu will tell you a little bit more about the series and who will be speaking. Our first speaker is Shinobu Kiriyama. So let me give a little introduction to him. He is the Robert B. Zions um, Collegiate Professor of Psychology and Director of the Culture and Cognition Lab. He's originally from Japan, but moved here, literally here to Ann Arbor, um, for his PhD in psychology, uh, starting as a Fulbright scholar. Um, since then, he's helped birth the subfield of cultural psychology. He's coined concepts like interdependent and independent self-construals and mutual constitution of the self and culture, and has spawned and led many research agendas related to that. Um, for this work, He's received multiple achievement and career contribution awards, including from the Society for Personality and Social Psychology, so SBSP, uh, CES, Society for Experimental Social Psychology, and the Japanese Psychological Association. He recently uh, helped lead the field as president um, of the Association for Psychological Science, APS, and as an editor for one of our top journals, um, JPSP. So without further ado, I'll hand it over to Shinobu. Thanks for coming. It's so wonderful uh, to speak to real people in the real room after the COVID year. But also, my heart is pounding. <laughs> There's an enormous amount of chance of embarrassing myself, right? In a real situation like right? So we'll see how that goes. So as Catherine uh, mentioned, we are organizing, uh, well, this doesn't work. Problem one. Oh, why is that? Oh yeah, okay. So we are organizing this, uh, this speaker series and I will not spend much time on this because I want to spend enough time on my talk itself. But please go through this list. And this is pretty good. Uh, this is pretty much as good as anything like this can be. Uh, of course, and there are many other people who could make the list as easily. However, those are really tough people. Uh, so really, uh, please do come and you'll have fun. Also, we have uh, this graduate seminar and several people registered it and it's going to be fun. Uh, we are going to meet uh, after uh, this class meeting. So if you want to attend, uh, please stay. You are more than welcome. All right, so let me start. Uh, just uh, I want to introduce myself for that. I'm, I'm from Japan, uh, from this lovely city, port city, facing the Pacific Ocean. And that's where I, I grew up. And there's a lot of cultural bona, different that studied uh, in this big time tuna fishing. Uh, there's a lot of cultural bona. I was born and brought up as a son of Buddhist priest. I have nothing of cultural honor and I didn't fit in. And maybe that's part of the reason why I went all the way to Kyoto to study psychology. And then uh, eventually I came here uh, to study the same thing. Now, 
When I came here, as you might imagine, I had a lot of cultural shock. So for example, uh, here, Blinky Burger used to be there. Uh, I think some of you know what this is. Uh, it used to be here uh, in the corner of Tankari and Division. Now it moved to uh, where Ashley uh, Street uh, these days. Now what's amazing about this place is the amount of choice that is required. You have to make a choice at every step towards the end of creating a burner of your own. And that's an extremely cultural experience. And at the beginning, I had no idea what was going on, it's especially because I came from a culture like this. Everything is prefixed, and you have to make a choice, of course. You have to make a choice among different prefixed things. So experience like this and many other experiences of a similar nature engaged me in, into the question of what might be the role of culture in psychology. Now, once you think about it, yes, in the context of global uh, context, this question is really important. Where psychology came from? What it might mean? Psychology came from this Western part of the Eurasian continent. And in the last uh, maybe half century, it was transplanted in North America. And you could say the rest was Eastern. And it was uh, in many respects. However, does it pose any problems, issues? Well, surely it poses some interesting questions. What might be going on in, in the remaining places? But is there any, uh, are there any limitations whatsoever in our discipline of psychology because of this geographic uh, concentration in the, in a particular area? So that really motivated me to engage in medium, thinking about potential role in culture. Uh, in psychology in particular. Now, around the time already, there are some interesting studies going on under the heading of cross-cultural psychology. Now, I call myself cultural psychologist. Uh, people often make a big deal about this disciplinary divide, but we are really, uh, they are good people, we are good people, <laughs> and we are addressing essentially the same thing. But nonetheless, there was some difference in emphasis. Cross-cultural psychologists tend to study values or beliefs across cultures by using some method. That's great. And those are three extremely notable names. Hopefully it uh, became famous because of his mass research value surveys uh, uh, on IBM markets across the group. Now, of course, you know, Ronnie Gaffer, uh, he used to be here uh, before he passed away several years ago. And he's a designer and, you know, basically he, he was a guy who created the world value survey. And finally, um, uh, Shalom Schwartz. Shalom was a PhD from the social psychology program here, and he eventually became a leader of the field investigating cultural values. Now, interestingly, those different lines of research were fairly independent, but nonetheless, this convergence is very remarkable. And one dimension that came out very systematic and very, very robust is the dimension of individualism and collectivism. With this, you might associate this name, Harry Drianis. Uh, he also passed away, but he made a great contribution to the field. So this individualism and collectivism dimension, now appears to serve as an overarching dimension that I see many different cultures. And one systematic finding is that well, you might say, is that finding that's a, that you do a survey just to find it out? But nonetheless, this convergence of the data indicated that Western Europe 
and all the other places which are related to it, including North America, are highly individualistic compared to the rest. Now, we tried to do something different. Uh, Dick is here, and Hazel used to be sitting somewhere here. Hazel Marcus and Dick is here. Now, we are experimental social psychologists, and mentality back then was that, okay, okay, cultural values are very different. And people say many different things, <clears throat> but aren't they just saying it? And at the end of the day, how important is it? Those bodies might be in accounting for, but we are really interested in knowing, that is psychological mechanisms or psychological processes or thinking, feeling, acting, all those kind of fundamental elements of the human mind. That's the kind of question so-called cultural psychologists, you know, I think that Hazel, me added to the, uh, list, uh, the end of the list, trying to spin out uh, this very question, does culture matter in understanding human psychology? So here, uh, well, Catherine was nice enough to talk about independence and interdependence, and this thing became much bigger online. So Hazel Marcus and I discussed two different views of the self, independence and interdependence, and I will get back to it shortly. And correspondingly, Dick did a great work delineating cognitive differences between Western cultural context and people engaging in, in primarily East Asian cultural context. And one of the memorable stimulus uh, was generated by a student of his and a student of mine, Haka Masuda. And basically, researchers use stimuli like this to investigate where people tend to uh, allocate attention, you know, to the central place or the context. Oh, my oh, I was listening to my voice very well. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. Is, is it okay? All right, very good, thank you. All right, so now around the time, main conclusion, at least from my point of view, is that there's a very important difference between West and East Asia. Now, Western culture is, there's a view of the self as independent. Many things are organized with this assumption at mind. This can happen in, personal relationship, you choose your partners. That's based on independent uh, framework. Or when you want to reason, you know what you are thinking about, what you want to think about, what you want to focus on, and you turn things around by focusing on that particular line of thought. That's also independent, right? Now, if you go to other contexts, especially say in East Asia, very different views of the self, which we call interdependent, appears to organize social life. <clears throat> so for example, now, you know, you can choose your partner, but you know, my parents have very different opinions. <laughs> uh, sometimes it's really important to take those into account. Or thinking, well, I know what I want to think about, but you really have to pay close attention to many things in the surrounding. After all, you are, you are kind of embedded in broader social network, and it might be a sign of immaturity if you're just focusing on single thing you want to think about. So we expanded the field quite a bit back then, at least twice as bad as before. Uh, and uh, what emerged out of this literature is that there appears to be very systematic cognitive, emotional, and motivational psychological differences. So cognition tend to be more focused and analytic in the West, in East Asia, cognition tend to be more holistic. The range of attention appears to be broader. How about the emotion? 
emotional expression is very, very important and prominent in the Western culture. And that makes sense because after all, emotion really define this independent self and expressing it may well be very important. Whereas if you are in interdependent context, maybe emotional expression is not that important. And especially when say emotions like anger or too much pride could disturb social harmony and then emotional moderation may often be a more desirable thing to do. And one more thing, self-enhancement. Well, here you are special, okay? You are really special and this is a driver of your life. I can do it, I can do it, I can do it. And I'm very special. And that's the effect called uh, self-enhancement. And you are not just saying it. You can look into your brain and show some brain indicators corresponding to, to this kind of effect. By the way, that effect is very hard to get in East Asia. And in fact, every once in a while, there appears to be modesty, self-effacement. Now you can say, all right, all right, all right. So those East Asians are also self-enhancing, just hiding. They are just lying. And that's not true at the end of the day. Now, what kind of method did we use to investigate this? Well, in one experiment, we ask people to draw a sociograph. So just imagine that you, you are, uh, well, just think about your social network. Why don't you use a circle to designate people involved, including yourself, you, your friends, you know, in your social network. And then connecting those circles to show what the social network might look like. Now, why did we do this? Well, we did this when somebody, uh, Sean Davi, now professor in Rutgers, came to Japan and said, you know, Shinobu, did you know in Kyoto, if you look at the map, you know, some temples like Golden Temple or Silver Temple, those seem to occupy much larger space. You know, in New York, Empire State Building is huge relative to actual size. Now, the message is very clear. You know, size, physical size, appears to signify psychological size, psychological significance of it. So we decided to use this method to see how big the cell might be. Some people draw a social gram, social network like this, and this ME, me, uh, represent the cell. This is fairly prototypical of what you find in, in this society, okay? Well, actually this person appears to be a little bit modest than uh, what might be the case typically. Now, this is what is more common in East Asia. That is, if you don't know where me is, me is here, and on average, there's no size difference. And as you can see, in Western context, the symbolic self-inflation effect is quite sizable here, size difference between self and the average uh, of, uh, of other people's uh, uh, circles. And Japan, if anything, uh, the mean is absolutely no different uh, from zero, that is, uh, self is just as big as or as small as uh, the remaining circles. All right. Oh, by the way, uh, I, I'm showing rice because we did some study back then investigating the possibility that origin of psychological tendencies like this, especially in East Asia, could be traced back to ecological conditions which afforded rice farming. And why is that? Uh, you have to wait until Thomas Telham will be here to discuss this particular topic. But here we managed to publish it in one of the beta journals. Uh, and uh, they did a great job illustrating this idea. That is how rice farming has shaped psychology. 
And that's one of our early messages from this line of work. All right, so this is a, what I call cultural psychology 1.0. Now, what were there? Well, uh, somewhat yeah, you know, embarrassingly, uh, place our work at the beginning, but uh, please excuse us. Uh, Hazel was here, uh, and Dick, of course, Nisbet, uh, and also Taka, and many, many people who did many different studies to show systematic cross-cultural variations like this. That was very nice. Now, subsequently, people began saying, okay, you guys are doing, that's fine, but those are pretty descriptive. That's a very pejorative thing for anyone to say to somebody else who's doing science, right? So you guys are doing only descriptive words. You really have to begin understanding exactly why those things are happening. Now, many people began addressing those. For example, Daphne Ozamen using priming method to address this thing. Now, Thomas, um, well, he was an honors student when we began this rice study. Uh, and he, he took very different point of view to investigate much broader range ecology and how that might influence broader change of culture. And similar approach was taken by Aisha Usko. Uh, he was a postdoc when Dick and I worked with her in Turkey to investigate the role of ecology in independence or analytic thought. And, and Shinge, of course, is now champion of this approach. Shinge Oishi, uh, he is in Chicago uh, right now. Now, other way to look into those initial findings in greater detail was look into the brain. So the idea is very straightforward. Okay, we really wanted to say that culture go into the brain, go into the mind very, very deeply. Now, what's the best way to find evidence for it or disprove it for that matter? But that, that would be to go into the brain. So there was a fairly active line of research along this line, for example, Denise Park, who used to be here when she started this approach to culture by using scanner. Uh, and in China, Si Wei Han uh, did a great work. And we also uh, did a little bit. Uh, all right, so now, where might field be now? Are there any new agendas, new directions? Now, there are many. And today, I want to suggest Here, cultural psychology 1.x, that is, there's constant upgrade all the time, which is great, which is exactly how science make progress, and that's wonderful, and surely I did that. I, I feel very proud that I did it, but this literature has some limitations, geographic limitation. That is, North America, East Asia, you know, that's good. That's twice as big as before, but still there's a substantial limitation. Now, so that's, uh, that's bring to uh, my talk today, uh, beyond uh, East and the West. What can we learn uh, from this topic? And I believe that that could be called cultural psychology version two, but you will see, uh, you know, whether this is just a, too much of a self-congratulation. Right. Now, so over the last decade, we try to expand this, uh, the field geographically, primarily. And so those are kind of regions uh, we began looking into. And not just us, uh, but many other people. And in fact, I have to add that some people like Aisha Musko investigated this very problem even before everybody else was just looking at East and the West. So, you know, boundary or is not as sharp, but nonetheless, overall, much of the literature was based on uh, grounded in East-West comparison, and that was great. 
But now we try to expand and see what we might be able to learn. There are two very important questions. Is there any commonality in Northwest? Well, in one sense, we already know the answer from the cross-cultural psychology literature, all the body research, Hofstede, Ingohard, Triandis, uh, and Sharon Schwartz. That work shows that West appears more independent or individualistic compared to the remaining cultures on the globe. Or no West is relatively more interdependent and collectivistic, fine. Now, question two, if that's the case, is East Asia representative of the known West? If the answer is yes, game is over, right? I did that now. No, no. Other non-Western regions are quite unique. Again, you have to say the two have to study anything to know that. You know, <laughs> you can go many places. Every place is very idiosyncratic and unique. And where are those uniquenesses, idiosyncrasies coming from? Presumably and plausibly. We, we say traceable to ecologies and geographies. And I mentioned just a little bit uh, about rice and wheat uh, research, but that's initial indication. And there are many different clues these days, which I want to go through. All right, so imagine picture. Um, much of the literature looked at the West and the East. Now we are looking into those. And what kind of conclusion, even tentative, might be possible? So that's the main topic I want to discuss. <coughs> now, oral culture. Again, by using this particular slide, I'm kind of implying where, what are the most plausibly relevant ecological conditions. Now, we argue that this primordial ecological environment where population density is very low and tribal competition is very harsh, really it's important to protect your own in-group. Now, out of this, one really interesting finding that came out is that the self of Arabic people or people in Mediterranean or South well, West Asia, self is very big. And when we use uh, this method initially in Saudi Arabia, and since then we are replicating uh, numerous uh, uh, cultures, countries in uh, the Arab world, and all itself is huge. Sometimes as big as Americans, well, if that's scandalous, well, sometimes uh, self is even bigger uh, in the Arab world compared to uh, the United States. Now, one very interesting, potentially important point we wanted to explore was that on the surface, Americans, Iranians, Saudi Arabians are very similar you have them do this task, self is big, right? So behaviorally, very, very similar. Now, are they doing just the same thing? American story is a story you find in standard social psych textbook. Why do you want to engage in self-enhancement? Or would you end up showing this effect? Because the standard story is the self is special. You know, you really have to believe in yourself to survive. So this is likely evolutionarily adaptive selection, which materialized. Well, some people seriously argue that. No. Story of the other world is likely to be very different. Why do I show the big self? Well, basically, if I 
narrated, nobody say that this way, just I'm imagining why Hassan from Iran might say, well, you know, I'm resourceful, I'm important. Why? Because I can protect you. You know, just in-group protection is such a very big point. And for that reason, self tend to be very significant and very big, which means in the context of my discussion today, self-enhancement may be in service of independence of the self in the West, but maybe self-enhancement is in service of one's interdependence. You want to protect you. I want to be part of this because I'm resourceful. To investigate this uh, in one paper, we used priming method one sterile way to remind you of your independence is to think about ways in which you are unique from your close friends and family members. So that's one condition. One very typical way to have you think about your interdependence is to have you think about how similar you might be to those people, your friends and your family members. We did that, and then right afterward, we administered this little sociogram test, you know, my pet test, right? All right, here's what we found. We replicated a big self effect here, also a big self effect here. Uh, now here, we are testing Americans and Moroccans, uh, one of those Arab countries we tested. Big self effect exists, but condition in which we found this, this effect was very different. American self is big when independence was primed. Moroccan self was big when interdependence was primed. How about opposite was primed? In both groups, the effect went away. So bottom line, is that self-enhancement or self-assertion, you can use standard social psychology task, like social graph task, or any other more sophisticated method to show this effect in Arab world and Western world, no problem, you can replicate this. However, exactly what those effects signify psychologically or culturally appears to be very different. So in one cultural context, this effect psychologically is a means to show one's inherent worth and independence. In other contexts, this is seen as a means to show one's resourcefulness to in-group. Now, let me move on uh, to Latin America. Very good friend of mine, um, in the same cohort when I was here as a graduate student many years ago, Paula Niedenthal. She did a wonderful job to find out what are ecological conditions, historical conditions that encourage emotional expressivity. So, well, she identified data set, very nice data set which indicate how heterogeneous racially and linguistically any given group used to be 600 years ago, okay? And then you can identify various measures of emotional expressivity. One came from Ekman tradition of emotional research. You know, in that research, you bring in subjects and you have them pause, smile and anger, right? Those stimuli are available. Now, they use those stimuli and have third, other group of raters <coughs> to that, to show how strong and how clear those emotional expressions are, okay? Some cultural groups show very clear emotions and in that sense, emotionally expressive. And this emotional expressivity was predicted by historical level of ethnic 
linguistic heterogeneity. Now, Latin America. Latin America is a typical region where this degree of heterogeneity is very, very common. So, so now, both Latin Americans and the more European Americans, oh, by the way, European Americans, uh, they are coming from everywhere. Uh, and heterogeneity, historical level, is higher too. So both Latin Americans and European Americans appear to value positive emotions and expression, excuse me, emotionally expressive. But does it mean that they're independent or interdependent? Maybe that question was wrong. Now, traditional way of thinking about it gives you a very clear answer. Emotional expression is a signature feature of independence. After all, you have passion, you have emotion, and you want to show, display, you know, kind of in our world, that's an act of independence. Now, Latin Americans, I bet some people here, uh, may have very different view of this. In the end, emotional expression is a very effective means to connect and resonate and understand without sharing any common language. So we did, well, Christina Salvador uh, and I, well, this is part of her dissertation. She is now a professor in Duke. Uh, we asked Sabu GX to think about the situation in which something good happened to the self, or something good happened to close others, or something negative happened to the self, or something negative happened uh, to close others. And in those situations, in each of those situations, we then asked them to show, say, how strongly they would express various emotions including positive emotions like those. Some of the positive emotions are socially engaging, close feelings, feelings of closeness or friendly feelings, basically signifying your social connection. Some other emotions are more disengaging. You're proud of yourself or you are feeling very high self-esteem, high self-efficacy and so on. So, we wanted to see which kinds of emotions people might express to show whether emotional expressivity might carry different functions and different meanings. So here, massive effect happened uh, in positive emotions. So how strongly they would express different positive emotions. Here, good things happening to the self, good things happening to somebody else, bad things happening to those people. Now, here are the results. Results are a little bit complicated. Uh, uh, however, generally Latin Americans and uh, uh, European Americans were pretty expressive, which is not shown here, by the way, okay? But nonetheless, the point of this graph is that exactly which kind of positive emotions people say that they would express were quite systematically different. So here, uh, one massive difference happens here. When something good is happening to yourself, for example, you got a very good grade in your exam, or you got a nice hour uh, for whatever work you did and so on, right? Now, not surprisingly, you feel proud of yourself, and also you feel high self-esteem, high self efficacy and so on. But this effect, was substantially stronger for European Americans compared to Latin Americans. So this is a, you know, emotional expression, the independent style, that the effect is much larger for European Americans compared to Latin Americans. Here, one more thing. This is interesting. So something bad is happening. For example, somebody is suffering from some setback. She lost a job, for example, too bad, right? Now, what would you do? In both cultures, people know what to do. You know, you show positive feelings, compassion, 
sympathy and friendly feelings, just to affirm social connection. So this is emotional expression in interdependent style, but this effect was substantially stronger for Latin Americans. So we used this data and similar data to argue that emotional expression is emotional expression, fine, but nonetheless, psychological significance of it might be systematically different. So emotional expression could be a mean to display one's passion and authenticity. That's emotional expression, the independent style, which is common here. In Latin America, the emotional expression could be a means to connect with others and achieve social resonance, which is which appears to be much more common in some Latin American countries we tested, which included Mexico, Colombia, Chile at the moment. All right. One more thing. This is our new adventure. India and South Asia. We know so little about that region, except Rick Schrader, John Miller, whole bunch of people argued that this region is highly, highly collectivistic and social centric. Okay. But Indian people are different. Yes, very different in very interesting way. <laughs> and if I'm allowed to share one interesting episode, Madhuka uh, was uh, well, from India. She was taking my cultural psychology course. And I argued that the Indians might be very argumentative. And she argued against that argument by arguing that Indians are not argumentative, which is Indian. But anyway, so that's by way of illustrating uh, the extent of argumentativeness you might find uh, in Indian cultural context. Why is that? That's an interesting question. One argument, one argument, one observation could be that India is surrounded by a whole bunch of different ideas, you know, different ideas from Belgian area all the way to Greek civilization. Above India, there's Tibet and South Asia uh, has a lot of different thought traditions. Another possibility is that India is at the cross section of trade, both ocean by sea and also lands. So presumably negotiation and business transaction was really, really very central. Now, here's a Nobel Prize winner. Uh, he, Professor Sen, who got the first Nobel Prize for Indians on economics. And he made this precisely this argument. Multiple ancient schools of thought in the region, plus many from, well, plus many from Belgian, Arabic, and Greek civilization on the west, from the Tibetan civilization on the north, and from Southeastern Asian civilization on, uh, on the east. Those different influences exist, and which means that there's a long cultural tradition of debating among divergent beliefs, distinct customs, and different schools of religious thought. And debating is a big deal, evidently, in India. So that's one of the top extracurricular activities in school. Okay, all right, so you, people are trying very well. However, important point is that, again, this debating practice in and by itself, well, debating practice in Indian context or South Asian context, maybe neither egocentric nor adversarial. It may be other centric and pro-social. Really? Well, this point has yet to be made in a crystal clear way, but nonetheless, Krishna Savani, my collaborator, he's in now uh, Hong Kong. Um, he did a series of studies investigating Indians and Americans are thinking about when they try to influence other people. American motive is very, very egocentric. 
you want to promote your agenda, you want to show you are great, and so on. Indians didn't show any of that. They are more other oriented. They try to help others to see the point or even help others achieve their goals and so on. So there's some initial indication making this point. And here's a Satya Nadeva. Do you know who he is? He's a, a Indian born executive in Microsoft. And he had a wonderful book just a few years ago, uh, essentially describing his experience in Microsoft. And here's what he says. Empathy coupled with new ideas had helped to create many inventions he was engaged in. Uh, Microsoft. So now this is a much bigger, bigger point than there is much simpler point I want to make today, which is that uh, Indians are in fact quite logical. Why logical? Because logics, logical rules can help you in debating argumentation. So this is one way in which we try to test it. We adapted the task. Aaron Lorenzian and Deck and Ed Smith, uh, when he was alive, uh, they used in investigating ability to stick to deductive logical rules in the face of distractions. So here's a basic uh, format of the task. Here's a fact. All fruits contain magnesium sulfate. Conclusion, therefore, all plants contain magnesium sulfate. All you have to do is to indicate how convincing this conclusion is. Okay. One experimental manipulation is how typical this instance is. Plum is pretty typical, but avocado, or zucchini, no, not zucchini, sorry. Uh, kiwi, that's, that, that's what I wanted to say. <coughs> Relatively atypical, right? And oftentimes you are distracted, quote unquote. You know, in the end, if things are atypical, many things can potentially happen and you may be persuaded less by this conclusion, right? So what we did um, was to, examine the rating of convincingness and rating of typicality. And we try, we, we saw how, how strongly those two might be correlated, okay? And here's a finding. <coughs> Our Japanese subjects correlation was very high. So almost typicality is no different from convincingness essentially. Uh, so logics, who cares? You know, just you have to use your intuition. Typicality is everything you care to know. Americans are pretty much like that, missing undergraduate, except it's, the effect is not as strong as, as the effect that Japanese subjects display. And this is a nice replication of Norenzai and Nisabet Smith finding from 20 years ago. Uh, that's nice. How about Indians? Here, big surprise. Well, maybe not. They appear to stick to logical rules, deductive logical rules, very, very strongly in the face of distraction, like typicality. That's our initial finding. We try to see kind of mental, psychological significance of it in the ongoing research. So you have to come back in a few years to know uh, what we are finding. Right. So here's a hypothesis. Logical reasoning is logical reasoning. However, psychological significance of it could vary. That could be a mean to display one's pure thought or a cognitive approach. However, that could also be a mean to connect with others by negotiation and debate. So here's an imaging picture. Uh, and some cells are missing. Right now, well, lots of people in this room are working very hard to fill those cells. Now, 
blue signifies the west and green signifies the green. And now one kind of a easy interpretation of this is to say that, well, you know, Western culture is independent. East Asian culture is interdependent. Now, the rest of the culture is both. Now, is that true? Little weird. So here's a little girl wondering. But how did you know that the behavioral features such as self-enhancement and emotional expression represent independence? Think of that one. So the link between such a behavioral trait and independence may be uniquely Western, possible. The traits are interpreted within the conceptual framework of independent self, they become independent. They may signify interdependence, however, when interpreted within the conceptual framework of interdependence. The non-Western regions may be interdependent, therefore, even when they look independent on the surface. Now, does this mean that our very conceptions or even perceptions are framed by the independent model? And is this not a cultural bias? Well, by the way, you know, this very idea that single feature can be interpreted multiple ways is a kind of core of social psychology, schematic principle in social cognition that can be traced back to Solomon Ash, change of meaning hypothesis. Now, in social cognition research, this whole idea was thought to be happening in the head of the he in each individual. Argument I want to make today, or hypothesis I want to advance today, is that this change of the meaning process might be happening in much larger time scale, time scale of history. So let's move on. So here are findings and the current puzzles and new potential hypothesis. Finding one, <clears throat> cultural values, the West values, self-independence, whereas non-West value, self interdependence Now, puzzle, why is that true? Why is that the case? You know, that maybe that's what people meant when they criticized us that our work were merely descriptive, but it's worth thinking about why this might be the case. And hypothesis one, interdependence is ancestral for humans, that is, Many years, people are connected to, people are attached to the group, that's the only way they could survive. That is, interdependence is ancestral. However, independence emerged due to a confluence of many different factors, which we cannot, I cannot get into, uh, that some people will talk about. Uh, in the northern part, northern, northwestern part of the Eurasian continent, I don't know, in the last 1,000 or so years, maybe, you know, Joe Henry would argue that time could be pushed even back. That's possible. Observation two, similarities and differences in behavioral traits. Now, if you look at those, East Asia is maximally different from West with other cultures in the non-West falling in between. Why? Is that? Well, hypothesis I want to advocate is that this similarity pattern may indicate the extent of non Western influences on the emerging West. You hear me? Okay. So, non West existed a long time, and now West is emerging, and past can influence the present but present cannot influence the past. That's as easy as that. So that, that's a logical deduction, so to speak. Hopefully that can eliminate next steps in research. Observation three, 
polysemic nature of behavioral trait, change of the change of the meaning hypothesis or schematic principle in social cognition, self-enhancement, emotional expression, and logical reasoning can be independent or interdependent depending on the broader cultural frame. Okay, well, I, I showed you some initial evidence for this. You know, the point still needs to be nailed, uh, but I believe that that's, there's a good chance of this being true. And hypothesis out of this is that this polysemy may indicate how the West reinterpreted what they imported from the rest of the world. Not the only way you can think of uh, in broader scheme of facts. Now, this hopefully can give you ways to investigate those. So here, very complicated figure, uh, which is bad. Uh, but once you think about how complicated things can be, this is much simpler than that. So there are several things you have to know. We, have, we typically observe contemporary cultural zones and we study them. And we investigated East Asia, Arab, North America, Latin America, South Asia, and there are many other regions, obviously, but that, that's, that's something we have covered so far. Now, I think you really have to hypothesize ancient cultural zones. Well, we have history. You cannot prove it. You cannot observe those things directly. Well, things are changing, right? Computational analysis of ancient language, for example, may let you do that, but not so far. Ancient culture must have existed. And I would argue that East Asian culture today has a history of rice farming, which had started about 8,000 years ago. Arab cultural zone, of course. Now, it's very complex, lots of cities, but nonetheless, primordial environment of desert had existed. And for the large part, it does exist still today. Latin America, South Asia, maybe similar stories can be made and hypothesis can be advanced. And finally, here's a time scale. Humans <laughs> stopped being hunter and gatherers about 12 or 10,000 years ago. And then many things happen, okay? So they are stuck in the land by farming, carving, okay? Freedom lost, okay? And then about three or 4,000 years ago, there's a massive movement of Central Asian pastoralists from kind of geographic regions close to Ukraine today, you know? That's the basis of Indo-European language group. So that's a massive movement. We have to take that into account. And, and then about 10,000 years ago, no, uh, 1,000 years ago, or maybe 15, according to Joe Herrick, there was an emergence of what you call modern West, that is cultural organizations based on the notion of independence, individualism which is still ongoing, obviously. A massive change must have happened in the most recent few hundred years, or maybe even in the last 50 years. So that's the kind of time scale you have to keep in mind. Now, let's use this very simple, well, this is more than West in mind, I understand. So our hypothesis, first hypothesis was this. In that interdependence was ancestral for humans and independence emerged due to a confluence of numerous often incidental factors in Northwestern Eurasian continent in the last 1000 years. Now, so basically those groups are likely to be interdependent. Hypothesis two, this similarity pattern may indicate the extent of non-Western influences on the emerging West. There must have been 
lots of influence here, in part because of this Indo-European language formation of this group, and Arabic culture is right next to uh, this region. Well, basically East Asia was kicked out from the party. Uh, and there does exist uh, evidence for it. Uh, this uh, modern computational genetic analysis allow you to say, indicate how closely those groups are intermixed. And East Asia was not really part of that. Hypothesis three, this polysemy may indicate how the West reinterpreted what they imported from the non-West. So hypothesis, there must have been lots of chemistry going on. So chemistic principle, change of the meaning. Now, this kind of thing is very common. For example, you know, before Ichiro and Otani, you know, baseball was very local in Japan. Okay, so when it was imported from the US about 150 years ago, you know, Japanese had no idea but to understand it in terms of samurai ethic, Bushido. Okay. So Babe Ruth was not really respectable. You know, instead, Socrates Bunty was a big deal, for example. So baseball was baseball as far as movement of muscles are concerned. However, cultural significance of it may have been dramatically different. Now, applying this change the meaning hypothesis or schematic principle to the cultural change. All right, so here modern West is emerging for a variety of reasons. You know, Roman church was involved, social structure was involved, and a whole bunch of other things involved. Now you gradually entertain this idea that I'm an independent person. Around the time, cultural practices of emotional expression came in somewhere from down south. Cultural practices of logical reasoning came in maybe far away, maybe from Greece, maybe from India, somewhere. And also cultural practice of uh, self-enhancement and assumption came in. What can you do? Well, you have to enforce your understanding on them and believe that that's true. Don't worry what other people, inventors, might have been thinking about. That's not relevant. Now, here's goodies, and you want to know what that is, and you do it with your own conceptual framework. So we try to make this argument in this paper. Um, so we'll see. Um, <clears throat> so let me summarize. So cultural psychology 2.0, I don't know if I convinced that that's really 2.0, but 1.9. Right? <laughs> so we want to go beyond uh, East and West. Now, there are two main findings. West is weird. That is, uh, independence is a primary organizational principle, which is weird, very rare in world, worldwide scale. But at the same time, there are varieties of interdependence that is differing styles of interdependence reflecting unique ecology and geographies. Now, <clears throat> some upgrades you might want, or surely you need, which include the following. You really have to look into cultural evolution over the last 10,000 years. Now, if you know what you can do or we can do, let, let us know. You know, maybe computational analysis of the ancient text, that's almost the only thing I can think of, but something needs to be done. And more work is needed to specify psychological profiles of various groups. You know, uh, uh, we covered a few, but there are many more and that need to be done. And globalization and localization, well, globalization is a big deal, and surely 20 years ago, globalization was underway, and you know, cultural psychology was supposed to be a dead species extinct by now. Now, that didn't happen because globalization all, often come with localization. There's always this pull of uh, 
tag, uh, which push you in globalization and all the time there's a pressure for localization. And immigration is extremely important, no question about this. There's a lot to be learned about acculturation. And so, you know, as a whole, this may lead us to 3.0, but is that, that's everybody's guess. All right, so here we are now uh, starting some investigation in Kenya and Ghana, Africa, trying to see what kind of culture uh, you might find. And so here are some people, uh, Tom, Emily, and um, Catherine, and this black woman, a uh, very wonderful person, Anna uh, 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 Osai Tutu. Uh, she's our Ghanaian uh, collaborator. And Irene is sitting here investigating South Asia. And uh, Yashin is there studying fine. Lots of things. Well, actually, she's uh, investigating localization these days, investigating very fine grained local differentiations within Minnesota and Georgia in the context of COVID 19. And Hassan uh, is our new member from Iran. So I'm very hopeful that something new will emerge. So, so thank you very much. Oh, questions? How does Russia fit into the categories that you have set up here? Well, I don't know. That, that's the most honest answer. There are some sporadic studies, including the studies done by uh, some of our students, Michael Barnum, that indicate that Eastern Europeans are very holistic and interdependent. Now, there's an interesting question of whether that made communism possible or whether communism really influenced the contemporary psychological data. Maybe both could be true. So, so now, in very broad way, I think it's fairly safe to say that Eastern Europeans tend to be interdependent and relatively holistic in cognition. Why that might be the case, that's a more, more work needs to be done. Yeah? I wonder if you speculate a little bit. I'm thinking about the clusters as you were describing them in the modern Western kind of uh, uh, clusters. Within that, there are obvious variations. Those sort of the varieties of capitalism notion from liberal right. market economies to coordinated market economies. Would you expect that degree of variation to be displayed in sort of cultural variation in behavior and cognition? Or is it too similar still? Well, so some of the work. And again, Dick was involved. Um, Jeffrey Sanchez Bark many years ago investigated the Protestantism and Catholicism. And if you look at uh, traditionally Protestant societies, that's where what we regard as Western characteristics appears to show in the most extreme way. So yeah, uh, surely, uh, and, and, and uh, you know, America is pretty weird in that regard. So whatever Western characteristic there might be in Western part of Europe, that appears to be magnified when, well, maybe just the weirdest of weird people may have come here. Uh, that's a possibility. And also experience of uh, frontier settlement may have encouraged that kind of mentality too. So yes, uh, there's likely to be fairly systematic uh, variations that still remain to be spelled out. 
Uh, so I think you're arguing in essence that people in East Asia are more altruistic or at least collectivistic, cooperative. So I'm wondering if these personality differences East to West uh, manifest in actual like real world solutions to collective action problems or I don't know, environmental problems or whatever kind of um, societal problem you might have studied. So if you studied this at the, exclusively at the level of personalities or do you think it's also manifest in, in these other ways? Yeah, uh, two points. One, this pro-social orientations are emphasized but that doesn't make them particularly pro-social sometimes. So one hidden aspect of the East Asian context is that people are stuck in the in-group. That is, it's very hard to escape your in-group. And if you are stuck in your in-group, you may be sometimes exploited. And you may be taken advantage of. And that very idea is sometimes called enemy set. That is, uh, you know, most uh, serious uh, enemy may be in your neighborhood because you are stuck, you are engaging in social interaction all the time and you disclose everything about yourself. So become, you become vulnerable to other people and the emerge people who take advantage of that. That's called enemy set. And in-group vigilance is very common, so that's what point one. Point two, actually, uh, you have to wait till the end of the series when Catherine is likely to talk about the possibility that effective economic intervention may depend on exactly how that intervention is framed. If you frame intervention as a means to promote your independence, that may backfire in some regions, including right, Africa, some regions of Africa. Now, much better option might be to frame this in terms of you know, kind of a survival of the group, flourishment of the family and contribution to family, uh, you have to wait. Uh, and I, that's my understanding. So, so now I want to give you a caveat about this pro-sociality of East Asians. There are some very complex phenomena that still need to be spelled out. So there are some horrible things that can happen within that context. However, this said, you know, framing of economic intervention may matter. And framing in terms of culturally dominant discourse may make it more effective. I hope that makes sense. Thank you. Thank you. Any? Oh, one more person in the back, yeah. Thank you. Uh, really interesting talk. Uh, I, it's really interesting just to see how cultures differ in so many different uh, tests and kind of psychological tests. I, I'm just sort of in my mind uh, thinking about the criticism, the first criticism I think you said, which is that some people would say this is merely descriptive work. Um, and I just wonder what you think would be the best way to advance uh, in, that realm, in that way. Is, is the best way to say something like, well, a thousand years ago, there were these changes and this is what led to something. I think you, you mentioned that. Uh, would another way be to ask how is culture transmitted from one person to another or one generation to another? Um, what, how, how can we develop, in other words, maybe a theory of sort of what are the processes that people use to represent cultures? Um, and would that be helpful for moving beyond description? Well, it, it's, uh, it, it depends on the question you want to address. Surely, everything I said today is consistent with all the effort investigating mechanisms of cultural transformation. 
you know, very similar or set of uh, mechanisms might may well have been involved in those macroscopic processes. Now, if you want to understand uh, those group differences or differences in broad cultural differences, you have to go beyond that, raising questions about how, where those cultural differences might have come from. To investigate this, I think the field needs to be more interdisciplinary. You have to take history seriously. You know, we call it cultural evolution as if that's a science rather than just history. But that's history in the end. And we need to come up with you know, a more systematic way to investigate uh, that historical cultural evolutionary processes. Now, just because it's hard to understand it doesn't make it any less scientific, I hope. Uh, and it's really crucial to understand this macroscopic dynamics to understand the contemporary cultural variation. And if you just look into uh, you know, immediate psychological mechanisms involved in cultural transformation, like mimicry, reinforcement argument, and so on, it's hard even to start asking kind of questions needed to be asked to address kind of question I addressed today. So I was thinking about the vulnerability of people to demagogues uh, in, in various cultures. And it's a problem that we have in the United States now. Um, but it's a problem that people throughout history have had. Um, and I wonder whether um, you see a cultural difference in this vulnerability. Well, it's interesting. Uh, this, uh, at least in the most recent past, is concerned this degree of societal divide appears to be more extreme in the Western world compared to some different world. Does that mean that everybody outside of the West is relatively protected in some way? I don't know. Maybe not. Maybe not. Uh, again, to address that question, I think you really have to take into account social context, you know, exactly why, when those things are happening. And surely, you know, this uh, very detailed analysis of traffic and social media, for example, might shed light on those questions. And Daniel's point about specific mechanism, for example, may, may be very crucial in starting to investigate. And in fact, Amy organized wonderful series that start investing, addressing this very question. All right, so, oh, you're right, please. Okay. Um, sorry for going all the way about this and how it's related, but I'm wondering what are your thoughts on like pathogen prevalence as a driver for like interdependence? Yeah, that's not all. I, I, I'm actually studying it. <laughs> Yeah, the pathogen prevalence, that's a, a, I believe that that can shape cultural practices. You know, that, that's, a, that's a very crucial element in determining who may be dying and who may survive. And some practices, well, Josh is there, uh, you know, but, that breed of evolutionary psychologists would call a behavioral immune system. That is some form of society, some form of institution may protect you more, right? And so that may be one very important element in creating social structure, cultural practices. And, and there may be even more. Uh, and I agree, 
that that kind of consideration need to be integrated into this kind of framework. You know, I, I it's it really interesting. You know, once you start rice farming, population density become high, and then physical danger goes down typically because other people are there to help you. However, population density is very low in the midst of nowhere. There's a greater greater threat of physical injury, right? So you know you could argue that this kind of uh, primordial ecological conditions may put some pressure on which kind of immune system may emerge or may become more dominant. So you know immune immune system against bacteria may be relatively more important in the middle of nowhere. But, you know, immune system against, uh, you know, uh, this viruses, you know, co contamination, this spread uh, infectious disease might be more relevant in high density places like rice farming uh, villages. So those are all possibilities that need to be investigated. Yeah, just one more. Let's finish this. Okay. Um, yeah. non specialist, but it seems like you emphasize geography and economic structures as a um, causal of cultural difference. What about um, cultural products, things like ideas or religion? Um, oh yeah, well, both how, important. And, both and, important. And how do you how do you how do you even go about drawing the lines to where you determine what? Cause. Well, you you have to go back to twelve thousand years ago when humans started sedentary way of living, and form of life was very different depending on the climate, depending on the geography, as well as what kind of crops happen to be available. Right, so. That's the geography and uh, ecology part. But once people start, say, farming or harvesting, you know, farming flat, rice as opposed to wheat, for example, once you are a rice farmer, it wouldn't take too long to start creating irrigation system because you have to control water to be successful, right? Once you create irrigation systems, that's a hierarchical social structure. And you end up having lots of beliefs, lots of narratives, lots of images and everything that conjure up to create, say, religion, all sorts of ideologies. Once that become, become the reality, it's very hard to separate original ecology and whatever a cultural product might be, and in fact, cultural product will systematically influence what appears to be natural ecology. So if you look at, uh, you know, rice paddies, those are not natural. <laughs> That's all the artifacts, just an artifact based on natural materials. So once that happens, that's not pure ecology. That's a cultural ecology, you know, cultural system that is grounded in natural materials. So, I would say, you know, ecology and the geography might have a little bit of a head start, but once people start living there to creating new environment based on whatever they can do to survive, then it's just that's cultural, as cultural as ecological. And symbols and stories and all those things are attached to it. And in part because of this complex, you know, once those cultures take place, they persist. Even when ecology changes, even when people come to cities where no rice paddies exist, where no desert exists, still culture reproduce themselves because this system gives you, you know, good enough way of life that allow you to live. And of knowledge. So anyway, thank you very much. I'm